Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? There's a variety of news items, starting from long-term evidence of CCP virus immunity, through to news about various uh, vaccine-related developments, some more interesting than others. Ancient viruses being dug up and possibly becoming the next sci-fi movie, animals engaging in conflict that proves to be interestingly similar to what humans do, the Hubble telescope being fixed, at least for now. These and other news items can be found at the timestamps listed in the description box below, starting with a long-term immunity to the CCP virus. Italy was one of the earliest countries hit hard and hit fast by the virus. They had some of the highest rates of infection, their medical system was overwhelmed, and even the lockdown didn't really do much to blunt that for quite some time. Fortunately, they were able to catch up, eventually, but it took a long time and there was a huge toll, not just in deaths, but in those who were infected. Having been one of the first countries that had such widespread infection and contemporaneous good record-keeping and developed systems, it allows for long-term investigation and monitoring of just what impact that had. Going back to May of 2020, nearly 99% of those who were infected still test positive to some degree, which means the antigens their body is preparing will give them some protection. Based on the timing of this study, it would appear that people who were infected have at least six, if not nine months, of protection from the first exposure. The researchers also note that symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals don't appear to have any significant difference in the degree of protection gained. This study also went one step further. Not only were they looking at those who were infected, but they tested just about everybody else they came in contact with. This allowed for the identification of asymptomatic individuals. What becomes even more interesting based on those numbers is that they could trace back just how many infections were generated by individuals. What they found was that about 80% of all the infections they caught were caused by 20% of the total infection group. That means there's a 1 to 4 ratio of one person will infect four others, and this is what caused the spread, or at least it was with the original CCP virus variant. The experience Italy had at the time is something that the world took note of, and as a result, things like lockdown came into effect. These early actions are what suppressed some of the worst possible outcomes in many developed countries. We've seen what happens if a lockdown doesn't occur in less developed nations like India. The successful interventions, if you wish to describe them that way, are what has contributed significantly to what could be called apathy rather than hesitancy for vaccinations. When we look at things like, say, MMR, influenza, and so on, many people are hesitant, either because they don't believe they need it, or they believe anti-vaxxers. In either regard, the current situation isn't stemming from either of these so much. It's the people think it's not necessary. Not that they don't need it, but that it's not necessary at present. That they can wait, whether that's a few weeks, a month, or even longer. Waiting like that is getting in the way of most countries' goals to have a large proportion of their population vaccinated in the very near future. This is also compounded by things like younger people who were largely asymptomatic to the original variant of the CCP virus, thinking that if it doesn't really have an effect on them, what need do they have for being vaccinated? It's much like young people shrugging off the influenza vaccine on the basis that they might feel under the weather for a few days, but it really won't have any impact on their overall health. Then there are concerns from older individuals that they may need time off work if they have a slight reaction, that they might have to prioritise family or caring duties. 
this group makes up a surprising portion of the population who isn't going to get the vaccine, according to at least one Pew survey. About 15% of the people they studied found that they simply didn't think they needed it. This has been exhibited by hospitals in certain parts of America which are currently being overwhelmed by a younger cohort of infected individuals this time. These same individuals, once they have been infected, want to be vaccinated, which unfortunately isn't possible. When you look at it this way, it's why America, and other countries for that matter, keep going in and out of lockdowns. Once you get the disease under control via vaccination, you can curtail the need for lockdowns and other public health measures. It more or less opens up society and allows you to return to relative normality. A reality that doesn't seem to be appreciated despite every effort to spread word about it, every effort by public health authorities to not only get the message out there, but then to provide incentives to be vaccinated. But no matter what's being tried, there seems to be a general sense of apathy. While on the topic of vaccines, we should now mention how one of the bigger characters in the anti-vaccine research community have now no longer been associated with a university. Christopher Exley. He was until, well, will be shortly from the University of Kiel. This is a British university, and they're well known for writing about aluminium in particular. Aluminium concentrations in vaccines are frankly, significantly less than what you would get if, say, you consumed a pear. Yet, for some reason, many researchers latch on to things like aluminium, components that have mercury in them but aren't elemental mercury, and others that work outside their field of expertise. This individual has something of a sordid history. Notably, two events in question. One, when his grant applications are being rejected by the Scientific Research Council in the UK because of his anti-vaccine stance. The second is when he tried to go to GoFundMe to be publicly funded for his research. GoFundMe cut him off for a campaign that spread misinformation. The public statement put out seems to indicate that the university let him go, and that they are unable to find anywhere else to be employed. Under the current circumstances across the world, with varying enrollments at universities and government funding being shunted towards research that has promise, the inability to retain his job, and let alone gain a new one, makes some sense. If you only have so much money, cutting liabilities now when you can afford to rather than when you are desperately short of money, makes far more sense. And no, the claimed influence by Bill Gates and other organisations and individuals really doesn't make any more sense. For most universities, if you're going to employ a researcher, they need to be publishing not just opinion letters, not just letters to the editor and similar, but original, impactful research that's then cited by others something Exley has not done for the most part, if at all, over the last few years. This means that the university's not getting the return on their investment for his employment. In fact, one criticism of his recent work is that when providing citations, it fundamentally only cited his own prior work, with a small number of exceptions. And that is both incredibly unusual and generally improper. Your work should fit into the larger body of research consistently, and you should be relying on not only your own work but that of others to demonstrate that there is veracity to what you're finding. Going now to uh, other health-related news, but in an entirely different avenue. A HIV prevention pill is now required to be supplied free under almost all American insurance plans. This is important, not only for its public health benefit, but also for the treatment of those who are at risk. At least in most other countries, it's either at low or almost no cost. America, with its 
a somewhat unique medical system is an exception to that, and this development would see that some of the most vulnerable not only to infection but the consequences of infection individuals will have long-term protection and hopefully not have to worry about protection at all in those terms. The guidance coming out of several government departments indicates that within the next 60 days, insurers must make it so that there is no copay, coinsurance, or deductibles for any of the visits required for this prescription. There should also be no out-of-pocket cost associated with it by the 1st of January 2021. In other news related to yet another virus, although this time nowhere near as destructive as HIV. Investigation of the common cold, yet another coronavirus, indicates that it was a thing before humans, or at least the modern human. That's interesting and strange. The discovery comes from 31,000-year-old baby teeth and the DNA that could be extracted from it. In that DNA, there were parts of several viruses. Some of these viruses were more common to us than others, such as adenoviruses. The viruses are interesting for a few reasons. One of the important ones is that they're very similar to modern viruses, specifically the adenovirus family but they come from two very different clusters and have relatively little overlap in their genome, which means that they're very different from each other, but very similar to modern viruses. This could mean a number of things, whether that's careful conservation of certain genes, convergent evolution over time, or something else. Although this particular sample was found in the Siberian frostlands near the Arctic Circle, a, another virus has been found in melting Tibetan glaciers. This one, though, is only 15,000 years old, so not quite as bad. That doesn't mean it's less likely to be the basis of some horror movie, or possibly yet another pathogen spreading across the world. Perhaps it would be the start of World War Z. Either way, it's an interesting virus, if only because of its age. Although we should say viruses, multiple have been extracted and been able to be identified. This is one of the bigger concerns with the reduction in glacier size and other areas that have historically been freezing cold. They have kept otherwise possibly dangerous viruses and similar pathogens in cold storage where they could not act or infect. By receding, they're gradually being exposed and, in theory, released. At least in this case, it's a case of discovery rather than release. 28 new viruses that have never been seen before. There were also five that we were already aware of. Going from the ancient remains to modern medicine now, the first US patient to receive an artificial heart implant. The 39-year-old male received the heart implant, which is made from a variety of what is described as biocompatible materials. These are materials that won't cause the body to start rejecting it or attacking it. In this case, bovine tissue, a few sensors, and an external activator that keeps it running, but also monitors things like blood pressure. The American man was fortunate that he was able to receive this development in technology and medicine. It's developed by a French company called Carmat. He was only able to receive it in lieu of other options because his condition had deteriorated to such a point where he wasn't even able to get a heart transplant. That meant that there were practically no options available for what he could have otherwise had to solve his problem, and would have either eventually died, or they may have been able to find some alternative. In the worst case scenario, they would have had to have taken an extremely risky procedure, and there's a high chance of death. You might think that this is a solution for the massive burden that organ transplants are in America, 
There aren't enough donors, but there's a massive demand. Unfortunately, that's not the case. This artificial heart isn't intended to be a permanent solution, and realistically, it could never be with some of the systems and materials used to make it. What it does do is pump enough blood through the body that it can make up for the shortfall in the patient's heart, taking off much of the burden that is otherwise applied. It's hoped that within six months or less, a heart would become available and the individual be able to have that transplanted instead. Going from medicine and the naked ape to the not-so-naked ape, specifically chimps and gorillas. Chimpanzees and gorillas tend to operate in two different areas for the most part. Chimpanzees up in the arbor and gorillas down towards the ground. Their encounters tend to be infrequent. This has allowed them to operate without much violence. Well, that is until relatively recently, where several encounters were observed. Interestingly, on both occasions, at least according to the reports, the attack was instigated by the chimpanzees, and both times an infant gorilla was killed. You may not be aware, but chimpanzees are particularly notable as assholes. The male chimpanzee will not only kill, but in some cases eat, baby chimpanzees if they are not directly related to them. This may explain some of the violence being seen and why an infant gorilla was killed. In other animal-related news, but this time ancient animal news, giant sea scorpions. Yes, we're going back to the arachnids. This time, the extra pointy-tailed variety. Fortunately, though, it would appear that there's no chance they're going to be alive today, as these are all fossilized. Moving on from the rather disturbing thought of giant scorpions, to environmental news, and something of a first. The UK has issued the first ever extreme heat warning. The UK is perhaps better known for its foggy mornings, being cold, and drinking tea. None of these are generally in concert with extreme heat. The temperature is expected to reach 33 degrees Celsius in a number of places. For those of you who insist upon using the archaic imperial system, this is about 92 degrees Fahrenheit. The heat warning is important for several reasons, one of the simplest of which is that heat waves like this are generally associated with much higher fatalities, particularly among the elderly and very young. In both instances, they are either unable to cool down or unable to maintain fluid levels. In some cases, the loss of fluid through sweating, urination, and so on can lead to the loss of ions and salts. This can in turn have an effect on their heart and other parts of the body. In the case of the extremely elderly, who often already have issues with their heart, it exacerbates these conditions and can lead to death. Going from weird weather phenomena to space, and Jeff Bezos' deployment of Blue Origin. He has now successfully gone on the first flight into near-orbital space. Admittedly, it's close enough for most people that describing it as space would be appropriate, but it's technically not correct. Having reached the boundary of what is Earth's atmosphere and space, 100 kilometers above sea level, Bezos and the three others on the capsule stayed there for about three minutes, and then they began to return to Earth. The entire process took 11 minutes, required no pilot or other specialized crew. In fact, the entire system was pretty much autonomous. This is somewhat different to what Elon Musk is doing, but it does open the door for what Bezos wants to do, turn this into a sort of tourist event where you can be taken to space. In other space-related news, we need to go further afield, all the way to Mars. Curiosity may have found evidence of what happened on Mars that would have 
impacted on our ability to find any evidence of life. What Curiosity found is that between two samples, there was a big difference in the amount of clay. Clay is a good indicator of life, as it's produced as a byproduct of eroding rocks, combining it with water, and a few other things to create it. The two samples taken were only 400 metres apart, but they only found a small amount of clay in one versus the other. The other had a lot more iron oxide. Iron oxide is, unsurprisingly, otherwise known as rust, and why Mars looks red. What they also found is brine, salt water, and that appears to have been what led to the patches where they're finding lots of clay and relatively little clay. The final news item we have for you this week asks the question, can an AI dream of electric sheep? And now it's possible they might be able to. The ability to get an AI to begin developing something outside of its area of coding and development is a big step. Humans can naturally use their imagination, for the most part, and this allows them to do things that otherwise they haven't been taught to do. An AI needs to learn, and the only way it's going to learn is to try it, test it, and then reevaluate. That allows it to then modify the procedure in a new way and try again. In this case, they found a way to get the AI to be able to figure out what an object would look like even if it had not seen that object before. Although not necessarily a novel development in and of itself, the technique has brought in new tricks, so to speak. The ability to amalgamate multiple images take them all and combine different parts of it to create something new. That, along with the fact that it's been published as an open source code that other people are able to use, tinker with, and hopefully develop further, means that the rather scary idea of an AI having wild imagination is that much closer. That's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions that you have below.